the name and face of one person has been changed or obscured due to privacy reasons. The following subject matter may be deemed heavy for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. The use of many insane asylums and mental hospitals was on the rise between the 18 and 1900s. Today, even though there are still many mental hospitals in use, the old ones are closed down, dilapidated, and abandoned. The practices of institutions and hospitals have changed a lot over time, but some of the reasons people are sent there have stayed the same. Their families did not know how to deal with them. I think like the first time I was actually admitted into a like inpatient hospital um, was I think my sophomore year of high school. Um, and it was on my mom's, I know it was on the 14th of February. Uh, I think it was an argument with my parents that escalated to me, like actually having to be admitted into it. A couple of times, my, I almost sent myself there once when I was younger and my mom wanted to send me there a couple of years ago. I used to self-harm almost every day, and my mother found some of my, like noticed some of my scars, and then I wrote everything down in a journal that I kept hidden in my room. Her boyfriend went through my room because he suspected I was doing drugs, and he found my journal, read it, and then told my mother about it, and she kicked me out of the house. My mom was more reluctant to send me to him, because she just felt bad, she was just like, I don't know if I'm being a good mother if my child is struggling with this so badly that she has to go into an inpatient program to get help. And then my dad's, my dad is more like, she's doing this for attention, but I'm just gonna send her because I don't wanna deal with her. That's the kind of idea, like the kind of attitude I got from him. She actually threatened to send me to a mental hospital. She said she was gonna have an ambulance come and pick me up, tie me down and bring me there against my will, whether I had a choice or not. Mental hospitals today are known to be far less cruel than their older counterparts. However, there is an air of strictness that has carried over. The hospitals of the past were very self-preserved. Medfield State Hospital, established in 1892 and closed in 2003, raised its own livestock and produce, as well as created its own heat and power. It was the first asylum built that used the cottage plan in its design. Like other mental institutions, it kept its many patients under strict watch. Like all the, like all three times, I did not have time to prepare to get like clothes and stuff like that. Because when you're going into an inpatient program, they have like specific uh, dress codes for it, so you can't have images of like snakes or skulls or anything because they're like that could trigger someone and it's also because the two like the places that I went were run by like Christians and everything so that's another reason why it was more strict and whatnot and um, like you couldn't have tank tops or like spaghetti straps um, you couldn't have anything with strings so like this hoodie wouldn't be able to wear unless I cut off the strings. Um, your shoes couldn't have laces, so they were like, you know, toms or whatever that covered your feet were good, or slippers. Couldn't have like any uh, hair styling products that were like heat. So you couldn't have like a blow dryer or a straightener. Usually we're not allowed to have um, jewelry as well, but like the main thing that I wear is like a cross on like a necklace. So they were like, okay, I guess we can keep that even though usually we don't let people keep necklaces because it could be used as a choking device or you can injure yourself with it. And then they make you take out your earrings, but I guess I told them that my ears had just recently been pierced so they can't really take them out. And they're like, okay, well, it's not really much of a hazard, so we'll just let you keep them in your ears. Alongside the old mental hospitals was a place known as Belchertown State School. Opened in 1922, it now exists only as rubble and dust abandoned. It was known as the home of the feeble-minded. 
housing a total of over 700 mentally retarded children of varying degree over its course. After 70 years of business, it was closed due to its horrible living conditions and severe mistreatment of patients. Today, the abuse of children in mental hospitals has decreased vastly, but they are still given far less freedom and choice than adults, being at the mercy of their institution's staff. It's vastly different for teenagers and adults. They kind of treat them differently as far as, like, treatment programs they have, but majority of it is the same. I think when you're an adult, you kind of have more freedom to do whatever you want. Not really like to do whatever you want, but like you're not required to have to get up or go to certain like programs that they have for the day. And then like in, when you're a teen, I don't know if it's the same for every single mental institution, but the ones where I came from, uh, it's, it's kind of similar to like a juvie in a way. <laughs> I've had a couple of friends go to them, so from what they've told me, I know that you kind of just stay there. They don't give you any type of, like anything that could be used as a weapon, um, and they have you on a set schedule for every day. The main doors to the unit were locked and you had to have like a staff member like wave you in. But um, if you needed to go somewhere, like say to the bathroom and it wasn't like near your room, more than likely you would have to like knock on a door or a wall and get the attention of like a nearby nurse. And the nurse would give you permission to go to the restroom even though it was just like right across the hallway from your room. Um, they restricted a lot of like personal hygiene stuff. Not to where like you couldn't use them every day, but you had like a little basket or whatever that they would take from you after you use, like take a shower or something like that. And um, they would take it from you and you would have to like leave it by your door. Cause I think depending on the stuff you have, they would say, okay, well, that has alcohol in it, you can use it to like get high or whatever, or drunk. Yeah, so a lot of it was just like, you have to get permission to do everything. You can't be running around the unit by yourself. Um, there is one that would make it seem more like a juvie, where like, when we were moving from the unit to the cafeteria, we had to walk with our hands behind our backs. And then we had to like, be, I think, two feet apart from each other, so we weren't touching. And that was a lot of uh, things, because <laughs> I think some of the kids were like really affectionate or touchy-feely with other kids. So they are like, yeah, we can't do that. You're <laughs> invading people's personal space. So, yeah. And then it was just really, it felt like really strict. And then whether it's when you're an adult, you're just like, walking around the unit, or you can go outside because they had like a little outside area. Um, you could stay in your room and sleep all you want. They would only like, I think the requirement was like you had to go to at least three like little programs that they had each day, but other than that, you could just stay in your room and sleep if you really didn't feel like doing anything. People who sought out refuge at asylums or who were sent there by their families had many different types of issues from each other. Some were severely disturbed, others were handicapped, but many were citizens who would have been able to function well in society if they were just given the chance. I was diagnosed when I was younger with ADHD and then growing up, once I got to middle school and everything, I was diagnosed with a severe impression and depression and anxiety. And later on when I had a very severe attack attack, panic attack, when my dad passed away, I um, was diagnosed with schizophrenia, which I have had my whole life. It was just never diagnosed up until recently. It's almost like a living hell because you're seeing things that no one else around you sees and you're hearing things that no one else hears and everyone else thinks you're basically crazy and something from a horror film. And when really you're just trying to live a life normally rather than having to take pills every day and get through it. 
Anything from younger than when I was living at my grandmother's house, I actually don't remember anything of me living there except for when I first moved out. Um, my family thinks that something very traumatic happened to me while I was there, but my mom refuses to tell me anything. She thinks that I'm not ready or not old enough or that it's just something I shouldn't know. And it kind of tears me apart not knowing that there's something that could have seriously happened to me that I am completely clueless to. I think majority of the reasons why I was admitted was just my relationship with my dad because my mom struggles with PTSD, depression, anxiety and all that so she kind of understands what I'm going through but I don't think hers are as severe as mine used to be so a lot of the stressors was my dad trying to like I guess mold me into something that I didn't want to be and trying to like prove his opinions on things and we were just butting heads too much so a lot of times in therapy they're just like well maybe you're just blaming everything on your on your dad because you, um, you're not accepting that everything kind of involves with you and it's just like no I'm pretty sure he's at fault at this because he doesn't agree with things and he thinks he knows everything but like he won't sit there and let you explain your side so you can try to make it understand, like understandable to him because he thinks he just knows everything. Every mental hospital, past and present, has its own different types of treatments. The past ones focused more on lobotomies and a damaging to cure method, while recent ones focus on talks and medication. The best treatment, however, like it has always been, will continue to be debated throughout the ages. I definitely think it depends on which institution you go to. I've had friends that have been to multiple different uh, hospitals and have given mixed reviews, but there's always one hospital that everyone favors over the other ones because the people there genuinely care rather than just going there and acting. It's just a job that they do every day. It's something that they actually want to help people with. So I feel like that field has definitely come far from how it used to be. I definitely don't think drugs are the first option to go with. I think definitely going to talk to someone and maybe like writing things down, trying to find different ways to get around it rather than automatically going with drugs because you can get addicted to those and or anything can really happen. Like they cannot work and you would have to be put on a million different drugs like I was. I was on tested drugs that weren't even um, out yet. It's just, it's not fun to have to go through so many different drugs you don't even know what the side effects are going to be, so. While you're in there, they have a lot of therapy, like they have family therapy where you're talking to your family with a therapist, and then they have group therapy where you're with a whole bunch of other people that are in the unit, um, and then they have like individual therapy where you're talking to an inpatient um, therapist and uh, yeah I would say like family therapies weren't really my thing and I don't think they really helped because at one point I had a family therapy and they gave me the same therapist that I had issues with the first time so because of him because I don't know if they didn't realize it but like he pushed every single button that weren't supposed to be pushed and basically said everything was my fault and not like anyone else's fault. Definitely in order to get the help that you need, you need to change basically your whole lifestyle in order to get through it. That's what I had to do. I had to completely change my outlook on life. I had to change my setting of where I was living. I had to change any relations I had with anybody around me. I had to complete turn into a completely different person than I used to be. I think I'm doing pretty okay. I wouldn't say I'm doing great, <laughs> like when I first came here, um, but I think I'm doing okay and I'm finding different ways of dealing with stress and just the craziness that comes with a school going through a teach out, so I think I'm doing good.
as far as um, not having to go to a therapist or taking medications. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm a lot more happy and outgoing than I used to be and just I changed how I am. I try and be like think of the happier things in life on a daily basis. I try to wake up with the first happy thought I can rather than going to sleep crying like I did every night. Because really the most important thing is to not just feel like you're all alone because that's the worst feeling ever. <laughs>